Over the past century or so, academics have made great progress in many areas, including Albert Einstein's progress on the theory of relativity, Alexander Fleming and his discovery of penicillin, Francis Crick and James Watson's discoveries about DNA, etc. However, there's one field of research where we haven't made much progress, and that's within the field of economics. For the investor, a growing economy is an important assumption for his long-term returns, and that is why this is a top 5 takeaway summary of the book How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, written by Peter Schiff. And this is The Swedish Investor, bringing you the best tips and tools for reaching financial freedom through stock market investing. Takeaway number 1. The primary goal – increasing productivity. First, we'll go through three concepts that are very important for an economy to grow and then we'll handle two factors that are important for an economy too, but that, when mishandled, can cause it to crash. A good definition of an economy is this. The effort to maximize the availability of limited resources to meet as many human demands as possible. We demand quite a lot. Basic demands include things such as food and shelter, but we also demand more advanced things these days, such as smartphones that come with the latest technologies and supercars that come with great acceleration and environmental bragging rights. Say that um, it previously took people an average of 0.2 working days to meet their daily demand of food, a thousand days to meet their demand of getting a shelter, 10 days to get that neat smartphone and 600 days for the supercar. But today, it only takes 0.1 days, 500 days, 5 days and 300 days to meet those demands. The economy has then been growing. An increase in productivity has allowed food, shelter, smartphones and supercars that of course are limited in their quantity to become more readily available to the general population. This is the goal of an economy. Think about it. Compared to before, you can now get a house, a supercar, 10 smartphones for all your relatives and food for a thousand days and still have 50 days left for leisure time, compared to buying just one house before. This must be a good thing. Just think about how many days you can spend reading books in a nice hammock. Supercars don't produce themselves at the price of 300 working days instead of 600 days just by coincidence. There are a few prerequisites for this. It usually takes new tools, which come from innovation, which in turn comes from savings and risk-taking. No person is particularly innovative if he has to work all day just to fulfill the basic need of putting food on the table for his family. For an economy to increase its productivity then, which is the primary goal, savings are required. And this is what we'll cover in the next takeaway. Takeaway number 2. Savings benefit everyone. Why savings are important for an economy to grow is quite easy to illustrate. Peter Schiff provides an excellent illustration in How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes about three fishermen living on a deserted island, but for that you'll have to get the book yourself. However, just think about it like this. For every large or semi-large project, there must be savings. If no one in the economy saved up more than a single day's worth of money, how would then, for instance, large infrastructure projects be built, new medicine be discovered, industrial innovations be made? Such projects cost up to many thousand days of savings for many thousand individuals to complete. Now, all savings are not created equal. Some help the economy grow faster than others. There are four primary ways which savings can be used. They could be saved for a rainy day, consumed for extra pleasure, lent out to someone in need, or invested. The first alternative doesn't really help the economy grow directly, but it is a great buffer for times of turmoil. Some individuals 
companies and governments have learned this the hard way during the current pandemic. Their second alternative doesn't help the economy grow. This is the worst use of savings. The economy doesn't grow because we consume more. We consume more because the economy grows. According to Peter Schiff, thinking that we can spend ourselves out of economic troubles is the main problem with the current paradigm within the field of economics. Consuming more than we can afford today will eventually be troublesome, either for our future selves or for our children. Loans are the third alternative, and if they are made for business purposes rather than for consumption, they can really help an economy grow. Just think about the aspiring entrepreneur. Without savings from either himself or someone else, he or she can't possibly build his own business because he'll need a steady stream of income to put food on the table for his family. The fourth alternative, which is investments, is great for the same reason that business loans are great. By looking at these four alternatives, it's easy to see that a capitalistic economy works. The lender wants interest payments and the investor wants dividends. And these are both selfish motives, but they will have positive spillover effects to everyone else in the economy too. If the person who has savings wants to earn more on those savings, he'll have to invest or lend them out to others. A very important concept here is opportunity costs. Just like pretty much everything else, savings are limited. Savings that are used for consumption could have been used for business loans or investments. It is therefore harmful for the growth of our economies that most governments are running monetary policies which incentivize consumption but disincentivize lending and investments. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we'll get to this later. Takeaway number three, comparative advantages. Once upon a time, there existed an economy where only food, shelter, smartphones and supercars really mattered. In other words, not too different from the one that we have today. In this economy, only four people lived. Abel, Babel, Cable and Durable. They were all equally interested in food, shelter, smartphones and supercars. What they weren't though, was equally efficient in producing these items. Babel, Cable and Durable could produce one day's worth of food by working 0.2 days, while Abel could produce it in just 0.1 days. Babel was the most efficient shelter producer. He could build one in only 500 days, while it took the others a thousand. Cable was a gifted smartphone designer, and it took him just five days to produce one, while it took the others 10 days. Similarly, Durable was the most skilled supercar maker, at a production time of 300 days, instead of 600 days like the others. If they used their talents in an optimal way, they should let Abel produce the food, Babel build the shelters, Cable assemble the smartphones, and Durable make the supercars. Over a lifetime, they each demand food for about 30,000 days. Five houses, 500 smartphones, yes these guys are quite clumsy, and 10 supercars. Now, if they don't use their skills or comparative advantages in an optimal way and produce everything themselves, they would each have about um, 10 to 11,000 days of leisure over a lifetime. However, if they use their comparative advantages and let each do what he is best at and then trade goods with each other, they'll have between 18 to 20,000 days. Simply put, if workers in an economy specialize at what they are best at, the productivity of the economy will grow. Comparative advantages are important for the economy within the country, but it is also important for the total economy across the globe. For instance, if um, King and Ling, who come from an outside country of Able, Babel, Cable and Durable, would be capable of producing food in just 0.05 working days and shelters in just 250, everyone could have even more leisure time. Moreover, 
more savings would be available for business loans and investments, which could increase the productivity of the economy even further down the line. You might ask, but what would then happen to Abel and Babel? Well, with some savings, or potentially a business loan from Cable and Durable, they would probably discover that everyone is also interested in buying some fancy clothes and fancy watches, now that there's so much leisure time. Remember this, the goal of an economy is not to provide jobs. The goal is to maximize productivity. In an economy where productivity is increasing and comparative advantages are maximized, the prices should actually be decreasing. Ling can sell shelters at the price of 350 working days and still make a profit, while Babel had to sell them at the price of 600 working days to make the same profit. Takeaway number 4. The role of the government. There are a few services that arguably should be provided to everyone in an economy and that, for one reason or another, are poorly provided by a free market. Almost everyone agrees that two such needs are those of personal safety and justice. For example, Able, Babel, Cable and Durable might consider giving away some of their production to hire Enable for security and Fable for justice. Enable and Fable would then be hired as this country's governmental employees. One important thing to notice here is this. The government itself doesn't produce the basic needs of the economy. It uses the taxpayer's savings to provide services. For this reason, government spending is the same as taxpayers' spending. Never forget this. A bit more questionable is when the government starts to provide services like healthcare, infrastructure, education and banking. We'll get to banking in the final takeaway. Sure, these are all services that are demanded in a modern economy. There's no discussion about that. The question is just if the government can provide them in a more efficient way than the marketplace can. Consider this. Politicians want to be re-elected. For this reason, governments spend savings where it is politically most critical to do so. Private lenders, on the other hand, only spend savings where it is economically defensible to do so. Because of this, private lending is more efficient in bringing out the strongest species and speed up the evolution in society. Once again, the key concept is opportunity costs. Savings are necessary for the economy to grow, as we've seen previously, but they come in limited quantity. And remember that the government is nothing more than a facilitator of private savings. If the savings are wasted, the economy grows much slower than it could have. In some cases, it even causes it to crash. During the financial crisis, for instance, it could be argued that the government played an important part in the downfall. The boom that occurred in housing prices was partly caused by governmental actions. The federal interest rates had been lowered to make borrowing cheaper, and banks were incentivized to issue riskier mortgages, as they knew that they could sell these loans immediately to two governmental entities called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In other words, the government decided that American private savings should go towards an upgrade in the housing standards of its people, especially people with limited finances. Let's just say that this turned out to be a very poor use of savings. If you want to hear more about the what's and why's of the financial crisis, check out my summary of A History of the United States in Five Crashes. Takeaway number five, the function of banks. Banks facilitate two great functions in society. They allow people to save in a safe way and they may take more educated decisions when it comes to how the savings should be allocated than the average individual. In this way, banks increase the productivity of savings. The interest rates, or payments to those who decide to lend their money to banks, are decided by three factors primarily. A desire to maximize returns on deposits, 
a fear of losing capital on risky projects, a time preference for consumption. Here's an interesting thing in the economy today. If the government would decide that the price of a car is a fixed $20,000 or that a smartphone must cost $500, what would you say about it? You would probably yell, COMMUNISM! We do not enjoy when the government intervenes with the price and production of goods, as, after all, we've seen what it has done to economies in the past. However, for some reason, we are okay with the government setting the price of savings and loans. In the US, the Fed is effectively determining the price of money by deciding the interest rates at which all other banks can borrow and lend at through the federal funds rate. Here are three reasons of why it would be a better idea to have individual banks decide on this rate themselves, much like in any other part of a modern economy, rather than having a centralized entity deciding on it. The federal representatives do not have the same skin in the game as the owner of a bank has. For this reason, they make short-term decisions that the business owner of an individual bank would never do. It is very questionable if the centralized Fed can make more informed decisions than the aggregate of millions of independent decisions, well, at least more or less independent, in the marketplace. The Fed typically makes decisions that are based on political rather than economical factors. The chairman of the Fed, for example, is nominated by the president of the US. So, the fate of the president and the Fed chair are intertwined. And I bet that you understand yourself what type of consequences this might have. The inflationary monetary policies that are followed today are harmful to our economies. They are harmful because they incentivize spending instead of saving. This is important. Inflation is simply a means to transfer wealth from anyone who has savings in a particular currency to anyone who has debt in the same currency. As we saw in takeaway number two, savings are necessary for an economy to grow. Moreover, credit and leverage being used in a stupid way has been one of the primary reasons of all of five of the greatest economical crashes in history. If you'd like to hear more about these crashes and possibly become a little bit more aware of what might cause them in the future, head over to my summary of the book A History of the United States in Five Crashes. Cheers guys!